Okay, it's recording. Okay, I'm going to pray and we'll do this uh, very brief chapter 29 quiz and we'll move forward. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these students. I pray that this would be a profitable time, a time when we learn more about you and grow closer to you as well. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, uh, number, this is a chapter 29 quiz. Uh, who asked Jesus, how can we know the way? So Jesus said, uh, you know the way where I am going. He said, I'm going away. You know the way where I'm going. And this person said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Who is that? Nobody knows. It was Thomas. It's a third third uh, choice there, Thomas. Um, to pray in Jesus' name means we must what? Do you guys have the... Does anybody have the quiz in front of you? Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm still getting it out. My team's isn't loading. Okay. Uh, so to pray in Jesus' name means that we must, I'm going to give you the choices, uh, include his name often in prayers, pray for what he would pray for, use his name as the closing of the prayer, address our prayer to him instead of the Father. Which of that is the answer? Which of those? The third one? Uh, nope, not use his name in, closing, in the closing of the prayer. We do say one? that often, but that's not it. I, go ahead, Elijah. Is it the first one? Nope. <laughs> pray for what he would pray for? Pray for what he would pray for. In essence, it means pray. In essence, it means praying according to his will. But your book um, calls it praying for what he would pray for. Uh, the word comforter could be translated lawyer, doctor, consolation, or rabbi. Which of those would be comforter or counselor is another way of putting it. Lawyer? Lawyer. That's correct. Which of the following, according to John 14, 6, is not something that Jesus said he is? The truth, the Messiah, the way, the life. The Messiah? The Messiah. He is the Messiah, but he, in, in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. According to the lecture, how is the peace of Christ different from the peace of this world? Uh, so here are your choices. It is permanent and based on faith. It is permanent and private. It is easy to find and bring joy. It is diff different and difficult to find. So how is the peace of Christ different from the peace of this world? It's either the first or the third one. <laughs> uh, it is permanent and based on faith. Yeah. It's permanent based on faith. If you look in your lecture notes, it says that. Uh, according to the lecture, which of the following is a type of false peace that the world seeks? There are two answers here that are correct. The peace of escapism, the peace of tranquility, the peace of hard work, and the peace of false security. Peace of escapism. Peace of escapism. Just think about something else and you won't be anxious anymore. Or watch a movie and you won't be anxious. You'll forget about life for a while, as uh, a, a popular song of my day put it. Uh, and then what's the other one? The peace of false security. Peace of false security. And that's talking uh, in part, at least, about you know building up a big nest egg so that you don't ever have to worry about running out of money and uh, and then you'll you'll have peace, uh, but stuff happens, right? Like COVID, and it messes with your your nest egg. Uh, okay, so that's the quiz.
uh, and you can Katie, don't turn that in. Uh, I'm you're just going to have that so that you can study for your test. Uh, and now we're going to turn our attention to the uh, lesson in chapter 30. I'm on page 217 if you want to follow along with me. Nothing tasted better to Drake on a cold winter morning than his mother's hot homemade biscuits topped with a large portion of her homemade Concord grape jelly, jam, or preserves. Just thinking about it made his mouth water. But that tasty treat didn't just happen. A lot of work went into making it possible. His mother, of course, had to uh, can the jam and the jelly working for hours in a very hot kitchen during the heat of summer and without the benefit of air conditioning. Before that, she had to pick the clusters of purple grapes and the vine from the vines, braving all sorts of bees, yellow jackets, and other pesky biting insects who were wanting their share of the sweet juice and pulp. But long before any of those clusters of grapes even began growing on the vine, Dale's father had to do his part to make the grape jelly jam or preserves possible. Before the grapes began producing, he had to examine the vines closely to determine which branches were broken, weak, diseased, or damaged. Then he took pruning shears and began to cut away at, uh, the bad branches. Dale's responsibility was to gather them, uh, gather all of the discarded branches and pile them into a heap and then burn them. At first, Dale didn't understand why this task was necessary. Wouldn't they get even more grapes next year if they left all those branches on the vine? Then his father explained to him that all those branches had, uh, all those bad branches did was sap up the other good branches for their nourishment from the root and the larger part of the vine. By cutting away or pruning the branches, his father was allowing more of the life-giving, grape-producing nutrients to flow to the good branches. That in, tur in turn guaranteed a much larger harvest than if they left all the branches, both good and bad, intact. Jesus used a similar illustration in the lesson you are about to study now. He said that for his children to bear fruit effectively, God must prune them, cutting out what is bad or a drain on their spiritual vitality and thereby allowing his life-giving graces to flow unhindered into the believer's lives. As they respond to the pruning process, he enables them to bear much fruit. How is God pruning your life right now? Are you resisting his, uh, vine, his, excuse me, his wise pruning? Or are you trusting in his wisdom to bring forth an even greater fruit, bring forth even greater fruit for his glory? Uh, and I'm going to read uh, John 15 to you. You can open up there. But I just realized I left my stronger glasses in the classroom, so I need to go grab those. I'll be right back so that I can read the smaller print. Okay, I'm back. So it says, um, John 15, 1 through 27, but that's the whole chapter. So here we go. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. Again, this is the night he's um, arrested, the night before he's crucified. Uh, it's after the Lord's Supper. Maybe they're on their way to um, the Mount of Olives. Maybe they're on the Mount of Olives. Don't know for sure. Maybe they're by a vineyard. Uh, maybe they're in the temple where there were clusters of grapes that were um, etched into parts of the temple. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is he is attempting to prepare his disciples for what is to come and attempting to comfort them in advance of that. And he says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the, uh, the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I commanded you, so that you will love one another. The world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will, keep, they will uh, also keep yours. But all these things they will do uh, to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not been uh, guilty of sin. But now that they ha now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that was written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So that's John 15, and we're going to look at these questions uh, in the book. I'm on page 218 here. What does it mean to prune a branch? What do you do when you prune a branch? I cut it and make it look nice. Yeah, you cut it off. You, you, you remove it from the rest of the bush or the vine or the tree, whatever it is. Why would a gardener uh, or a farmer do this to a fruitful branch? The, 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 the bush or the vine is not dead, but why would it do that? To why would someone the, do that? Go ahead. To make the fruit uh, more like, to make the fruit better, because that way more nutrients can go to the fruit instead of growing other branches. Right, to make the fruit better and to produce more fruit, right? More and better fruit. Um, we moved uh, a year into our marriage, we moved from a little house in Old Town Bellevue that Jeff had bought before we were married, and we lived there for our first year of marriage, but um, it was always his house, and I wanted a house that was my house, and so we bought a house over in Twin Ridge, and there's this beautiful, I know nothing about gardening, by the way, I mean, like, really seriously, nothing, and, and I don't really want to do it. In fact, I don't want to do it. I believe that gardening is a great thing. And I think it's a wonderful thing to teach kids. I just don't want to do it. So um, I didn't know anything about gardening. And there's this beautiful big rose bush with these huge roses in the backyard when we moved in. We moved in in June or July, I think. And um, I thought that was great. And I, you know, clipped off some of the roses to put them in, you know, in a vase and all that. But I never did 
anything to that butch. I mean, I just let the thing go. And I didn't know, I, I didn't even know I was supposed to. And each year the roses got smaller and smaller and smaller and the bush got gnarlier and gnarlier and gnarlier because I never pruned it. If I would have pruned it, I would have been able to keep that big, beautiful bush with the big flowers. But it was, it was less, it had less vitality. It had less life in it. It, had, it was less beautiful because I just let it grow. And I didn't do the hard work of pruning uh, that bush. The same is true in our lives that God will prune us. God will cut away those things that are not helpful to us, cut away those things that keep us from growing spiritually. Uh, and we need to let him do that. Um, and sometimes he tells us we need to cut things out for our own health in him. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's what the pruning process is like spiritually as well. Um, what does this passage teach us about our ability to perform good works? What, what does Jesus say? Let's uh, look specifically uh, at verse uh, 4. What does Jesus say in verse 4 of John 15? Nobody got it in front of you? Uh, it says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am uh, the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abide, abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So, we cannot be fruitful. We cannot um, do what Jesus wants us to do unless we abide in him, unless we live in him, uh, unless we get our strength from him. So what do you think Jesus means by his command to abide, or some versions say remain in him. What does that mean? What does it mean? You, you abide in your house. What does that mean? To live there. To live there. To live yeah, it's the place where you dwell, right? Jesus is saying he needs to be our dwelling place. He needs to be the place where we live. He needs to, to be the foundation of who we are. Uh, it isn't just he's a part of who we are. It's that he is... He is where we reside, where we live. Um, and, uh, and in order to do what he desires us to do, we have to. We have to live in him. Uh, what kinds of people are those who do not abide in him, uh, do not bear fruit, and are cast into the fire? Um, so, uh, and apparently I think there's going to be something in the lecture on this, but th those people who, if they're believers and they're not abiding in Christ, they're going to be pruned. Um, but if they're not believers, then they, they can't abide. They can't be part of the branch. They can't be part of the vine. Uh, and so they're, they're taken away from that. Uh, they're not able to be part of that. Weird on Um, so, uh, next question, uh, what is the purpose for Jesus' commands and warnings uh, in this passage? Look at verse 11. It says this, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. 
So why did Jesus tell his disciples this? So that they might have what? Joy. Joy. So that they might have joy. Uh, the purpose is that, that we would be filled with his joy. Uh, and then uh, what is the, the fruit? Uh, what is the fruit in the life of a believer that he wants to be overflowing? Uh, and this this is in verse 12. What does he say in verse 12? Well, you don't have your Bibles. Because this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Um, so what does he what does he want our life to be characterized by? I like glorifying him. That's true. That's true. But this is my commandment that you love, love one another. Yeah, our lives should be characterized by love. Love for God and love for others. Um, Jesus said, didn't say, they'll know you're my followers by how much you know about me or how many Bible verses you can recite. He said, they'll know you're my followers by your love, by the way you love uh, God and the way you love others. So uh, he wants us to be overflowing with sacrificial love for one another. And then in verse 13, Jesus says, um, greater love has no one than he would lay down his life for his friend. What do you think was on Jesus' mind as he said that? Who was going to lay down his life for others? How Jesus laid down his life for us. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest example of love ever. Um, and, and he's saying, I want you to lay down your life, not necessarily literally the way Jesus did, but to give your life for the purpose of, of loving him and loving others. Um. If you were a disciple, what would you have thought about those words when you remembered them uh, a year later? So when you looked back on that, when you looked back on Jesus saying, greater love has no one than he would lay down his life for his friend, and then at post-resurrection, what would your thoughts be on that? That there was no greater love than Jesus's love. Yeah, no greater love uh, than that. Uh, even greater than giving our life, you know, to save someone else. This was giving his life to save the world. Um, I, yeah. Um, what is the attitude of worldly people toward you? What, is, what does he say is the attitude of worldly people toward believers? I should hate you. They hate you. Yeah. Now, that's a strong word. Um, and uh, but certainly they don't understand. Right. I mean, I have a, a former neighbor who's a, a, a good friend, but her uh, daughter is good friends with Katie. Um, she thinks I'm nuts because I've given my life over to, to Christ and, and teaching kids the Bible and all that. Um, and, you know, maybe I am a little crazy. I know that's not the norm, right? Um, but it's who God's called me to be. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm okay with her thinking I'm weird. That's all right. Uh, so yeah, uh, the world just doesn't understand, doesn't, doesn't see it the way, uh, the way we do. Uh, and then I'm not going to make you answer that last one. Uh, do they know enough about your faith in Christ to hate you as they hate Jesus or to think you're crazy. Um, yeah, are you living it out in such a way that they know that you love Jesus? Okay, so any questions on any of that? 
Okay, as I said, you're, I think we have one more chapter, if I'm correct, we have one more chapter uh, before uh, chapter, this is chapter 30 and after chapter 31, you'll have a test. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's next week. And then, um, and then we'll hustle through the last, uh, the last unit and you'll have a, um, you'll have a final that's over that last unit and John 1, 1 through 18. Everybody got that? Yep. Questions, concerns, opinions? Done? Okay. Well, that's all I have for you today. Uh, and I think we're meeting again on Wednesday. I think I'm meeting with almost every one of my classes on Wednesday. You may be the one class I'm not meeting with on Wednesday, but I think I may be meeting. Yeah, no, I'm meeting with 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. I think we have on like 12.30 with you. Yeah, I'm going to be all Zoomed out by Wednesday afternoon, but that's all right. It's good to see some of your faces at least, see Jake, and to hear your voices. It's always good. Okay, if you have any uh, anything you need to ask me or tell me between now and Wednesday, just uh, call, text, or email, okay? Okay. We'll see you. Bye.